We're here visiting with Ron Raybo. He farms with his wife, Julie, uh, north of Albin. Tell me a little bit about what you're growing, what your production systems are here on this place. So uh, right now, uh, we're 100% certified organic farm. You know, we pretty much always, almost always have ground in transition, but the goal is to obviously get that certified organically. Right now, we raise winter wheat's our primary one. Uh, we raise proso millet, uh, green lentils, uh, and chickpeas. And we're interested in trying some other cropping systems. Um, we've looked into camelina, quinoa, and canola, and just see if those work. And I'm not one to just try something one time and say, well, okay, it didn't work this year, so therefore it doesn't work here. If you can hit the right year with the right crop, uh, I really believe in this area we have a unique opportunity on dry land to be able to raise a variety of things, maybe not consistently every year, but I certainly think that the potential's there. So what's your basic crop rotation? Well, I, I wouldn't necessarily have, say that we have any basic set of crop rotation. And on the organic markets, we don't just raise something and take it to the elevator and, and say, what will you give me for it? We raise a crop based on where the demand is for that crop. So if I had a demand for a crop, then we're going to try it. I mean, wheat is pretty much a given. That's going to be in our rotation. And that's okay. going to be planted in the fall? Your winter that's going to be planted in the, in the fall. fall. So we're going to plant in September, uh, and it's going to be harvested the following July. Uh, now, the amount of spring crops that we grow, again, depends on what the market is, what the demand is, but also, if I have a potential for more profitability in spring crops than I do with wheat, I'll raise more spring crops, which are going to cause me to raise less wheat the, the next year, which will help balance the profitability out on my farm. So I have to weigh out all of those things. So your spring planted crops would be your millet, um, your pulses? Right, it'd be, it'd be the pulse crops, the millet, you know, potentially any ancient grains, mm -hmm. um, any of the other crops that we talked about, some of the smaller grain stuff. So why organic? You know, really, uh, there's a couple of reasons. Number one, really I had to look at my business and say, okay, what is going to work best with the system that I have? What kind of land can I acquire? And quite frankly, I had to look at all my assets and I had to say, okay, what's producing for me and what isn't producing for me? And there's some gut-wrenching decisions that go into that. The other one was when I was a conventional farmer, which is why I started out, when I'm mixing those chemicals up and I'm around that stuff and I have little kids, I just didn't think that that was probably the best thing to do. You know, if you're exposed to that stuff, maybe it doesn't have any long-term effects, but what if it does? And I'm not willing to take that risk. What was your transition period from conventional to organic? And then how long have you been farming organically? You know, our transition period was fairly long because I dabbled for so long. Uh, one of the things that actually helped me in my transition is I leased part of my farm out while I was growing it um, to another operator. And uh, he was great in, in willing to work with me and teach me how to do different things. And I observed from him. He was an organic farmer, right? I've been certified organic for, I want to say, roughly five years. Um, although not all of my ground was certified at that point. I mean, you're always, if you have ground that's dirty, um, what I mean with noxious weeds and things like that, you're going to get those things knocked out first. And, and sometimes if we have those problems still, we'll go in and take care of it and take ground out of organic because, you know, we just have to make sure that we're controlling things that we can't control organically. And I think that that's the way, one of the ways to maintain the integrity of what we do and making sure that we're maintaining the quality of what we raise, but the integrity of the ground that we're raising it on. Being organic has helped me become, actually it's forced me to become a better manager. Because I'm organic and because I rely on that ground and what it produces for us, the management that I have now is night and day more intensive than it ever used to be. Because before, you could say, well, I'm lacking in this, it doesn't matter, I'll just spray it. Or I'll just pour some fertilizer on it. Uh, it doesn't work that way in the organic operation. We can't just go around and, and fix whatever we need to fix, you know, overnight at least, because it was broken. We have to really be engaged and really pay attention um, so, so I'm a much, much better business person and a much better manager because of the system that we use now. So when you switched from a conventional to an organic system, did you increase your reliance on tillage for weed Absolutely. control? Absolutely. 
absolutely. And having to get tillage machines that I've experimented with a lot of different machines. Um, I'm continuing to experiment with a lot of different machines. You get to the point where you think, okay, I think I have it figured out. And then the next year will roll around and you'll say, wow, I don't, I don't have it figured out at all. I need to try something else. And so we're constantly kind of evolving and changing our tillage operation. Um, we've become very invested in technology. We have three larger tractors that are driven by GPS that have those systems on them, that have the auto steer on them. And so uh, it's really helped um, increase our efficiency. You know, we can get within a couple of inches when we're planting, when we're tilling, and when you're farming thousands and thousands of acres and you're doing it repetitively over the season, two feet on each pass is a huge difference. I mean, you, the time that you can save, the amount of equipment repairs that you can save, the amount of fuel that you can save, all of that. And so we've also integrated uh, an app that we use. And so we have satellite imagery of all of our fields and all of my guys have an iPad. And when they're on their tractors, they enter what they're doing on a particular field in a day. Um, and then I can go back into the system when I work with my certifiers, my buyers, the FSA, the NRCS, whoever I'm working with, and I can say, okay, this is what we did and when we did it. And then every time we get rain on a particular field, not on a section, but on a particular field, all of us who are on the system will get a notification that says that, you know, this field number and this lot number got this much rain on it. So it's a beautiful tool to be able to use from a management standpoint to say, okay, well, we've, we know that we don't have to be up at this place because we haven't got any rain for 30 days. Um, and we really want to be careful how deep we till, when we till, what machine we use because of the amount of moisture profile that's left in the, in the soil itself. You know, I think plowing is necessary, particularly in an organic farming operation. But I don't necessarily think that it's important every single year. But I think that there's ways that, and there's machines out there that we can use that will help us with organic matter by integrating some of that mulch in say the top, you know, six to eight inches rather than burying it 10 inches under. Um, but also eliminating some of the hard pan where your roots are gonna go down and hit that hard pan and then they're gonna spread out rather than continuing to go down. Typically our system is gonna involve a plow, a mulch tiller, maybe a one-pass machine and a cultivator. Uh, we use a smaller sweep machine that has four-foot blades. A lot of undercutting blades, blade machines like that, will have five and six-foot blades. We found that the four-footers go on the ground a lot better. Um, we've tried some other tools, the mulch tiller. We have a, a row of discs in the front and it chops up the stubble and then we go with really big shanks in the back that just have straight points on them and the goal of those is to go down, like I said, about 16 inches and break that hard pan. We have treaders on the back of it so it levels everything out, packs it nice and firm on top. We'll hit it two or three times over the summertime. And then when we go into plant, we have a level and firm seed bed that also still has mulch incorporated with it. And we had a near perfect stand on everything that we did. We have a, a couple of Quinstar Fallow Masters. And instead of plowing or instead of mulch tilling, we'll just go in and cut the stubble and it lays the stubble over, but it's a light surface, but it's also shading all that soil so it keeps the moisture in there. The dilemma with using that machine all summer long is that if you don't have the moisture um, and the right conditions, the stubble doesn't break down and then you have a problem in heavier stubble areas to go in and plant through that. Really the, the one that I would caution the most for myself uh, is a disc. Uh, our ground is very fine and so we have to be careful how many times we go over it with a disc because a disc is really a pulverizing machine and it only works in the top few inches of the soil. It creates a hard pan and you can really get carried away with a disc by using it too much and the ground will become too fine and then it will blow. So in terms of your nutrient management, what's your nutrient management program now that you're organic? There are some fertilizers um, that are OMRI certified that you know, we can use on organic operations. I'm not fully convinced that they're worth the money yet. I think that they'll probably eventually get there. But I really think the best uh, nutrient management that we have is through crop rotation. Uh, we've really tried to um, use some of the legumes um, like the chickpeas or uh, like the lentils to help fix some of that nitrogen. 
do you do regular soil testing? We do. Yep, we do regular soil testing. We'll just, you know, not on every field, but on a few fields just to see where we're at as far as, you know, what our micronutrients are doing and what some of our major nutrients, you know, like particularly we want to look at phosphorus and nitrogen in the soil and how that's how the crops are responding to those. So have you used manure and compost then? We've, we've used compost. Um, we just actually made another contact for manure. We have to do a manure source verification. And as long as that works out, um, then we'll probably start experimenting with some of that too. Mm -hmm. Have you noticed any change in your soil health or your soil quality over the last five years as you've switched? I think that based on what I was doing before, uh, I think that our operation and our soil health is better now than it used to be. I can say that because it has become better naturally. You mentioned when you started you really didn't know how to farm. What were some of the sources of information or the resources? What was the biggest help to you? Uh, I'm one of those guys that learns a lot by trial and error. And uh, so that was, that was a big teacher for me. It continues to be a big teacher for me. But really, you just have to get good at asking questions. Sometimes in agriculture, we're so fiercely independent that we don't ask questions. And what you'll find that the more questions you're asked, the more resources you'll find because almost everyone involved in agriculture is willing to help each other out. You just have to figure out who those people are. I think that experience, you know, speaks volumes, really. But just because you have a good experience, a massive amount of experience or several years of experience, doesn't mean that the decision you're going to make today is the right one. So what you have to be able to be comfortable with in your own head is, am I willing to make a decision that might be wrong? Almost any decision that you make can also be the right decision if you help make it that way. Mm -hmm. um, that just because you have a failed crop doesn't mean that your business is going to fail. It doesn't mean that you're a failure as a farmer. If you run with the same set of decision-making tools the next time, it might be 100% the right decision. But if you never make that decision in the first place, you'll never know. Mm -hmm.